put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Star Trek The Animated Series Series Review These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise to boldly go where no man has gone before. This makes up the last two years of their five-year mission mostly exploring how bad of an idea it is to do a a concept such as a series and putting a time limit on it because it would you know the original series in the at the end of the 60s did not get more than three years and what if they had gotten more than five or this series had gone on for more than two although I believe this the animated series here was actually always meant to only have two seasons like the this jumps right into the continuity or relatively soft continuity of the original series with yeah, the there's no real indication that time has passed, and a few years did pass between the ending of the, you know, the the last aired episode of the original series, and then the first airing of the, yeah, of this the animated series. I believe the it was from sixty nine to seventy three, so. Yeah, but you can't really tell. There's no, like, you know, in the years between... The, this is genuinely just the last two years of the overall five-year mission. And honestly, other than the, you know, the, the shift between live action to animation, yeah, this doesn't really... You know, you could watch this immediately after the original series, and you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell that they weren't just made, you know, that it wasn't just another two seasons of the original series. And like the original series, this does not have a pilot, although the original series has an unaired pilot, and there is no real finale. This was created because when they finally fixed the rating system, they realized that the original series had actually done immensely well. It had been an extremely popular show. And you know, and yet the 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 myth persists that Star Trek fans are these, you know, reclusive virgin nerds living in their parents' basements, you know, the when in actuality everyone was watching the, you know, the, the, I believe the most, you know, the group that TV most seeks out, that, that, you know, products most seek out to, well, yeah, entertainment most seeks out to get are the you know, the, the young male demographic, 18 to 49, something like that. And yeah, they were huge into this. So yeah, they realized that. But the problem was the, the props and such were already, had already been gotten rid of. So yeah, rather than rebuild all of that from scratch, they opted for an animated show instead to, you know, that was seem to be the more fiscally responsible approach. Now, like, you know, most Star Trek, really Star Trek except for Deep Space Nine, this has a very idealistic view of the future and the nature of humanity. 
with, you know, yeah, idealistic, utopian even, where, yeah, the future is very, you know, peaceful, prosperous, and, yeah, you know, there are no, you know, emergency cryo, you know, yeah, maneuvers, no, no poop-tatoes. Matt Damon really, really needs to stay out of space. It is not agreeing with him at all. This was made before the films, and yeah, at the time it was made, basically, you know, no one knew that there would be more live action series or, you know, the, the movies or anything, and Gene Roddenberry apparently would not have made, possibly not have made this at all, or made it more canonable if he knew that there would be more. To briefly clarify, more live action series, and Gene Roddenberry, of course, being the creator of Star Trek. The adventure, the, the captain is the adventurous Kirk, who is quite the ladies' man, although that really isn't seen that much here. It's more, it's very clear in the the original series and some in the movies, such as when upon a, a female major character, upon first meeting Kirk, greets him with my my oath of celibacy is on record captain Sh he does shatner some in this he does the the pause acting some although you know some of the other elements of the shattering are less clear in the animation then we have spock the first officer and science officer who is basically Kirk's logic and he is a you know his his parents one of them you know his mother is a human and his father is a Vulcan so he is somewhat torn between the two cultures and you know having to always express his intelligence and go by his strict logic the, the Vulcan side of him, when clearly he does deeply care about, you know, his fellow officers and the like, clearly cares deeply about Kirk. They, yeah, they have a very strong friendship. And there's this running thing of, you know, he will express something in a very specific manner and you know he will you know yeah and and the doctor character who I'll get to momentarily will you know say what you mean is and then he'll say it in a more emotional more human more straightforward way and Spock will respond I believe I just said that on the show he will sometimes Troy and I'm not going to be explaining that one for, yeah, that that one's a nugget for the the fans. And then we have the the doctor, nicknamed Bones, Doctor McCoy, who represents Kirk's passion, and or Kirk's heart. He's very passionate. He's southern, and you know he speaks his mind. And the, yeah, th these three characters are really the, the focus of the show where, you know, the, the, the rest of the Star Trek shows are ensemble, ensemble shows. And this does have the same issue as the original series and The Next Generation, the Yes, in fact, the, the Gene Roddenberry Star Trek series. Because the, the, 
the entire main cast are all military officers and they're on a military you know mission that is the the main yeah the the story story engine i believe is the there is less room for characters to be themselves and to express themselves than in yeah things for you know fiction where it isn't so distinctly you know if if someone is like having an off day in this it's not you know it's it's actually dangerous for everyone else on the ship so there's there's less room for the characters to have flaws and such and yeah although th that is far more an issue you know the the characters are just about flawless on the next generation but yeah and that you know i i would say that the later shows the the star trek voyager deep space 9 not enterprise got a good balance between you know we have to you know we have an important mission and the characters actually having some human you know some some weaknesses and such that got to be expressed and bones is in this made a full commander and the we have the chief of engineering Scotty who voices a number of the guest characters basically if they don't get someone from the outside it's probably going to be him the uh, Uhura voices a few Nichelle Nichols I believe is her name voices a few of them and I'm afraid I don't know I don't remember Scotty's name offhand I mostly know these actors from Star Trek so but yeah you know aliens technology and various he'll often do the voice for and I haven't quite been able to find out why you know it's possible that he just really expressed a desire to maybe he was the the best of the the main cast at changing his voice or the like maybe he was the least expensive to keep getting back for recording sessions you know maybe he was just the the one who could best act you know my my ex fiance suggested that maybe you know he he isn't actually scottish so the the accent is put on so you know where the rest of the character where the rest of the main cast speak in their native accents basically so yeah with him putting on the accent for the main character he plays he could do guest voices without that accent and yeah you know hide the fact that he's a member of the main cast and there there are a few episodes where he voices like a bunch of different characters so it can get really obvious that that he's the one doing them he loves the ship and can really make you love it too and then we have Sulu, the pilot and somewhat of a swashbuckler, although that again is is, a, is less clear here. The, the part of it is, of course, that they just they don't have as many episodes to have these characters really do these very distinct things. And again, the you know the three main characters are really the focus. So yeah it's it's rare for an episode not to feature you know at least Kirk and Spock so yeah that just leaves less room for the other characters to really be prominent and Chekhov, Ensign Chekhov is Sir not appearing on this show he's the only of the main characters to not and this is of course in part because of the cost of getting all these big name actors and yeah he did get to write an episode and he tried to you know he he auditioned for a guest character on it but 
apparently they weren't really interested in cancer, so it was kind of lip service, and he was frustrated about that. That I can completely understand why, and I don't know personally. I've it's is very nice of him to to even be on later Star Trek, but yeah. Not everyone would have been willing to come back after something like that. And then we have Uhura, who is the communications officer, and Nurse Chapel, who is now a lieutenant, which I'm not sure she was on the original series, and they are both very strong female characters. Uhura actually gets to take command a few times on this and she is awesome at it she really takes charge there you know she makes no mistakes there's no hesitation she she knows yeah just great instincts great you know judgment just yeah she's she's awesome she really should have gotten to do that more but you know even having strong female characters as just you know having having large and important roles and one of them being black that was a big deal by itself in the late 60s so you know and later Star Trek did give us a female starship captain so and we have this you know this has a few characters that the original series did not such as Eric's M and Mres who are both bridge officers and aliens and this is of course you know and they're not quite you know especially Eric's is not quite humanoid like his head you know he has a long neck and his head you know there's no way they could have done this with like just you know no they couldn't have done this with an actor and their are their actual face. They could not have fit the the actor's face in this. So yeah, taking advantage, of course, of the freedom that animation offers, and very nicely. And also again showing, you know, this is this is this utopian future where yeah, you have alien bridge officers, and no one blinks at that. No one is at all bothered by that. And yeah, that's a really good use of the animation. And Mres is, you know, just briefly more on Eric's. He has this really goofy grin most of the time, and just yeah, he seems like he's he's content, and that's nice. And you know, yeah, you know, different colored skin and like yeah. And Mres has a, you know, it's basically very cat-like thing, and you know, it. We're we're not talking just like, you know, I mean, she does the purring thing, of course, but this is something that in makeup would have taken a lot of time. Like she, you know, very, like it looks like it's a cat's head on a basically human body. Like you know, you've got the the fur and the whole thing. So, yeah cat eyes kind of so yeah and just you know in general there are far more non-humanoid aliens in this you know many of them will be you know two legs two arms but like their their heads and the you know sometimes the movements that they you know clearly something that would have taken a lot of time a lot of effects a lot of money and yeah here it's all over the place and again a lot of the characters you know like sometimes they'll say I've never seen something like that before but it's clear that they have you know that this crew has experienced something you know alien before so excuse me they, their reaction kind of you know they, they you know it's not like completely blase it still has an effect but their reaction tells us these are seasoned guys. You know, you don't want someone with, you know, a starship just, you know, going, yeah, just going out into space and not really knowing what they're doing. <clears throat> Enterprise. So it's, 
yeah, you know, they, they, they have experience and they, they keep their cool in these situations where, you know, a lot of sci-fi from, it's maybe more the 50s, but a lot of it, you know, the moment that they see something strange, they act the way the audience might act. You know, they're like, what is that? And, and even when it's like scientists, they might act like that. And it just, I know what they were going for. They were going for, you know, ca the characters should act the way that the audience should feel, that kind of thing. And, which, which is fair, that was how they did back then, but it does sometimes have the audience, maybe more, a modern audience, questioning their, their, their ability to stay calm in a situation like that. And, uh, yeah. And the, the voice acting is great. The, these are, you know, film actors, and well, some of them, I believe, came from, like, a theater background. But these are not voice actors. And they do amazing, like, you would not, if you saw this before anything else, by these actors, and you didn't know that they weren't voice actors, you would not be able to tell. And that really, I don't know if it's like the directing or it's that these actors just that, well, some are and some were, rest in peace. You know, we've had some some great losses in the cast of the, the original series and, and thus also this. But just amazing performances. They, they, you would not believe. You would, yeah. And and it's just today, often like today, it's common. Like major film actors will just do video games, and not even just necessarily licensed games. You know, just like off the top of my head. You know, I played Dishonored. You've got Chloe Grace Moretz. You've got Brad. Brad Dorif? I, I'm, I think it's Dorif, not Dorif, or, yeah. And they're, you know, they're delivering great performances, and it's like, wow, these are, these are actually really good at doing voice acting also, where, yeah, it's just often not as good, you know. And, you know, Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon with Michael Bean as, you know, yeah. But Michael Bean is awesome in everything he does. You know, I, I once watched, don't ask me why, Clock Stoppers. Well, I guess it was probably because Michael Bean is. Michael Bean plays the bad guy in that. And it's just, it's this dumb little kids movie that, you know, about... I think it's like a watch that stops time or slows it down by a lot. You know, it doesn't quite stop time. They they look at a bug and they're just like, oh, it's still moving, it's just moving slow. I believe Jonathan Frakes directed it. <laughs> yeah, dumb little kids movie. Michael Bean is so much fun in it. He just he owns this villain. Yeah. The yeah. The the it also really it helps ground us that the you know that these are normal people you know they. The animation also has them looking and moving realistically, you know, the, the human characters. Yeah, looking and moving very realistically, and that along with the voice cast from the show really helps to, yeah, tell us this is actually, yeah, this, uh, yeah, saying this is humanity's future, not, you know, where where Star Wars is very much... You know, yeah, there are characters that to us look human, but are we sure they are? They don't seem to, like, miss Earth or anything, and they're scattered, you know, across the galaxy. It's, 
you know, they, they probably just look basically human to us. But yeah, where where Star Wars is very much, you know, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, Star Trek is meant to be our future. And the fact that we can see these people who are just real people, you know, they're they're very they're they're professional when they deal with aliens and such, but they are human beings, you know, they're not like superhuman or something. So yeah, it really helps ground that and increase the effect of what they encounter greatly. The <clears throat> there are a few bad performances by child actors. That was kind of the way it was back then. Like today, we have great child actors, great performances by kids, even some of whom are just, you know, not actually, you know, yeah. Who, like, I just recently rewatched Aliens. Like, Carrie Hinn playing Newt, she wasn't an actor, and she, you know, she did an amazing performance. So, yeah, you know, including some things that are really very difficult to do. You know, this this hardened, you know, almost PTSD kind of, you know, yeah. Anyway, this, like most Star Trek, especially the best Star Trek, this is, you know, character driven a lot of the way. This was not really meant for children, especially, it was, you know, especially made for fans of the original series. It was, however, on, on Saturday mornings, and, you know, as such, a Saturday morning cartoon. One episode won them an Emmy in that category. But, yeah, it's very much, it's a smart, mature, and not actually advertising toys, although I'm I'm not that familiar with the Saturday morning cartoons from the 70s. I know a lot of the ones in the 80s were, you know, just putting storylines to toy advertisements, so yeah. But this is one of several live, you know, animated versions of live action shows where the cast from those do the voice acting for their characters. Others include Mork and Mindy, Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, The Partridge Family, and The Dukes of Hazard. This had two seasons, 22 eps, episodes, and about 20 minutes per episode, you know, not kind of, you know, when they aired, they would have commercials and such, bringing it to half an hour, but, yeah. The, there is some humor, excuse me, again, like, unlike other Saturday morning cartoons, it's not really made to be consistently funny. But, yeah, there is some humor along the way, and it's not, you know, it's not, like, boring, and it's not too serious to enjoy or something, but, yeah, some humor, at times, it does get, like, Star Trek silly, kind of, yeah. And there are some new technologies, including a pre, you know, a proto-holodeck, and an aqua shuttle, which, yeah, that one's that one's really cool. Now they they are now able to go onto M-class planet, planets with the aid of life support belts, which adds a glow around their yeah their their body and. Like a lot of other, you know, Saturday morning cartoons and such, this recycles footage, and that does lead to some continuity errors and such. And this has a lot of really cool, great sci-fi concepts. 
you know, you encounter life situations, technology, and planets that are, you know, very alien to us. And yeah, there, there are, you know, a couple of sequel episodes to the original series where, you know, yeah, elements, you know, some of the, some of them are straight up sequels. Some of them just have elements that were introduced on the original series. And they, they can now also render these alien concepts in tremendous detail because, again, it's a lot easier to draw something, you know, that, that looks great in animation as opposed to having to, you know, yeah, do, do something that looks true to life, even if it's just like a you know, a matte painting or something, and and for that, you really can only use it for a great distance, where here, it's not difficult to just put a strange background behind these characters and such, and do, you know, movement that, with again, with these non-humanoid aliens, that would be very expensive and very difficult to accomplish in live action. And the, you know, episodes are exciting and fast, often very tight, and almost never too fast. And it tends to have a pretty good ratio of, you know, serious episodes, action-driven episodes, and more light episodes. And episodes will be fantastic, personal, or both. You can go in blind. You won't appreciate the, for example, sequel episodes as much. And yeah, there, there are other elements to this that, yeah, you, you might. But yeah, this you can still go in blind. There are times where guns save the day, although there's no real indication that you know, the normal citizens in this time have guns, so it would appear that Ben Carson did not get his way. Even before he compared gun control to Nazism, you know, he had already made it clear he's not coming for your guns, although if there is a dangerous situation where someone else has a gun, he will send someone else to take the bullets. The... Yeah, you know, if you go into this as the first Star Trek you ever watch, you can pick up, like, the characters, the technology that is common to the ship, and just, yeah, the, 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 the details of this utopian future and such from watching a few episodes. Same as with, you know, the original series, The Next Generation, and, you know, mostly Voyager and Enterprise. The animation was done by Filmation. It's relatively simple and, you know, there can be somewhat limited movement in frames and some limitation to the angles they'll do. And often when characters run, they will become silhouettes and, you know, mostly, mostly black, but sometimes white. The episodes do vary in quality and some are amazing. The majority I found to be good, you know, no better or worse than that. And honestly, there are maybe three that I personally, you know, of the 22, that I personally don't particularly want to rewatch, but some of that is 
you know, some of the things that the you might see in shows back when this came out, I'm not particularly fond of. But there is no episode that I would really say you should just skip. You know, there are, yeah, some of them are definitely better than others, but none of them are just outright bad, in my opinion. The... I am going to be going into some of what you'll encounter in the episodes. A something to you know maybe get you interested. I suppose some will consider these to be spoiler, you know, light spoilers. If yeah, if you don't want to you know hear such then you can you should probably stop the video here because it is the last thing I'm going to be going into so you're not missing anything yeah one you know one species has this really insectoid alien race and you get to see their vast ship and the yeah some of the technology on that there is some exploration of Spock as a child and there is there is a sequel to the triple episode and it's it's a really good sequel it's the right way to do a sequel you know i i understand that some fans were like bothered by the yeah them doing a sequel it's I, I can understand that but basically you yeah when when you just go it it does the right it it does sequel right it has the same core elements the the stuff that we really liked about the first one and it changes some things just enough so you you can tell that it is a sequel but it offers some new things it doesn't feel like just a retread there is at least one alien capable of changing its physical appearance this goes into cloning and some of the possible repercussions and some interesting ideas brought up by cloning. There is some magic. Mud reappears. There is some stuff where the that includes shrinking of you know major characters and such always a fun sci-fi thing to do there is an outer space Bermuda Triangle there is a one where some human characters can breathe underwater there is a very advanced like alien gun which has a number of very cool effects that it can you know modes of fire there is an alien zoo with humans in as some of the you know animals caged there's one episode which is essentially in a role playing game session and I know that some liked it personally, it wasn't really... I don't mind the idea of role-playing in, you know, Star Trek. I mean, Star Trek in part is role-playing. You know, you have these very characters with specific abilities and personalities and, you know, and they grow over the course of, you know, 
yeah, as you watch them and yeah, but the problem with this episode is it's essentially a Dungeons and Dragons kind of role playing and it introduces a ton of new mythology, new characters, you know, just I wish they had done it with just aliens we already knew. You know, bring I mean the original series has a ton of aliens. Some of them do appear on this and just, you know, some are just cameos. But bring some of those back and have it, yeah. We see some Orion pirate activity. And the... That covers them. I've read other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.